Many friends have asked me to explain why I believe in rebirth. For some reason it occurred to me when I was only five or six years old to contemplate with the slender resources available at that time the nature of my own existence. It seemed perfectly natural to assume that I had always existed. No one suggested this to me, nor would family discussion have been of any help. It was simply an insistent conviction that I had lived before, somewhere, sometime. My efforts to explore this problem were not especially successful, because consciousness seemed to disappear in an infancy that was dark and silent. Self-consciousness, however, did not seem to be a beginning, but an awakening out of sleep. It seemed to fulfill an expectation, like a person who, retiring for the night, was resolved to awaken at a certain time. It was difficult to figure out why I had awakened when I did, and in the particular environment which surrounded me. My feelings can be summed up as a simple predisposition to accept rebirth as an obvious and inescapable fact, so real and certain that it required neither proof nor defense. As time passed, I learned that the doctrine of rebirth is not a minority belief held only by a small group of eccentric individuals. Actually, it is one of the oldest and most universally distributed of all concepts bearing upon the total existence of man. It is held in common by members of every race and all levels of culture, from the savage to the sage. There is no reason to apologize because we are interested in a doctrine that has flourished for thousands of years, was publicly taught by Gautama Buddha, and stoutly defended by Pythagoras, Socrates, and Plato. Nor is it an old belief long outgrown, for in this time, our 20th century, nearly one half the population of the world accepts the law of rebirth in some form or to some degree, and this number is constantly increasing. Such statistics in no way prove rebirth to be true, but they do indicate that it is a major religious and philosophical conviction, entitled to as much consideration and respect as any other teaching relating to the origin and destiny of man. In this little talk, we shall devote no further time to the weighing of historical evidence, or an attempt to prove our point by reference to tradition or authority. My own beliefs are not based upon the fashions of any age, the opinions of the learned, or the teachings of the venerated. I would hold it a sacred right to agree or disagree with anyone, past or present. To me, the only valid foundation for conviction is such personal insight as I may possess, and such experience as has arisen, by which this insight is tested through applications. We must all believe in something. And even unbelief is only a negative kind of believing. Unfortunately, there is no way to prove spiritual truths to universal satisfaction. If then, for my own well-being, I must build my internal life upon some concept, I can choose such a concept as seems most suitable to my requirements, best calculated to contribute to a full and useful life, and in closest conformity with my highest ethical and moral convictions. The belief in rebirth has met this need in myself, and experience has shown me beyond doubt that it has helped countless persons to build a more gracious and intelligent way of life. At this point, it might be well to define our subject. The doctrine of rebirth affirms that man, as a rational being, is not identical with the body that he inhabits, that he has an eternal existence apart from body, and that in the course of personal growth he is born many times into the physical world. This series of embodiments makes possible the unfoldment of human consciousness and the orderly release and development of the infinite potential locked within man. At any given time, therefore, Man is the sum of his own past achievements. He must meet and face the present requirements of growth, and he is the architect of his own future. 
There can be nothing more useful or necessary to the individual than a basic philosophy for living, and codes of conduct are usually founded in religious convictions. Let us consider, then, our definition of rebirth in the light of those spiritual concepts which we have long held sacred. As a student of comparative religion, it seems to me that there are three essential doctrines which all enlightened religions hold in common. The first of these affirms that there is a supreme power or principle at the root of existence, which we usually call God, and that this absolute being, this source of life, is responsible for the unfoldment of creation. The law of rebirth assumes the reality of such a superior and infinite being, and demonstrates how this being attains its purposes in a lawful and understandable manner. The second essential doctrine of religion is the immortality of the human soul. This is the belief that man, transcending death, survives as a spiritual being, having an existence outside of and apart from the physical body in which he dwells during his material life. The superior and immortal part of man is more important than his body and should be given proper and due consideration. This implies that the attributes of the soul bearing upon character, morality, and ethics should be perpetually cultivated as indispensable to the growth and security of the immortal person within the mortal body. The law of rebirth affirms all this to be true. It points out, however, that the actual perfection of man cannot be accomplished in one lifetime, but is possible only through a succession of embodiments or incarnations. The third basic article of faith is the ultimate victory of good over evil. God, or the divine principle, is sovereign wisdom and supreme good, and all the works of deity must therefore be wisely and eternally benevolent. To compromise this conviction is to compromise God. But it is not always possible for man, with limited vision and understanding, to prove to his own internal satisfaction and contentment that the conditions through which he passes, with their uncertainties and tribulations, are in harmony with the will of an all-loving Creator. The law of rebirth gives the thoughtful person a larger perspective on life, provides him with better insight into the long-range workings of cause and effect and thus strengthens his faith in both God and himself. Man may not see the beginnings or ends of the patterns affecting him, but sustained by the doctrine of rebirth, he can envision a sensible way of life in which all things work together for ultimate good. There is nothing in the doctrine of rebirth that conflicts with man's basic conclusions on the level of philosophy. On the side of practical living, Rebirth strongly supports the highest ethical and moral precepts taught by enlightened philosophical systems. Nor does rebirth conflict with the abstract speculations of the learned as these relate to the universal state of man. It seems to me that the conflict is simply between idealism and materialism. Idealistic philosophical systems either sustain rebirth or find it compatible. Materialistic thinkers just ignore rebirth, but have no comprehensive concept to offer in its place. Rebirth cannot be incompatible with science, as now defined, because it deals with a level of ideas essentially outside the province of science, and about which science has advanced no certain or conclusive evidence. Psychology, an art which is assuming scientific status, has taken the attitude that the mystery of man's inner life is solvable and is gradually but surely differentiating between the person and the body which he inhabits. In view of these present trends, it is quite possible that the next important scientific discovery will bear upon the continuity of consciousness after death and apart from the physical organism. Certainly, evidence is accumulating which sustains rather than refutes the teachings of rebirth. To me, therefore, this doctrine is especially valuable 
because it does not force me to accept anything that appears unreasonable in any branch of learning, nor does it require that I reject the advantages of knowledge or the benefits of progress in religion, philosophy, or science. It places no arbitrary limitations upon the future unfoldment of learning, for it encourages advancement in every field. It is suitable to all degrees of scholarship, being as useful and inspiring to the uneducated as to the educated. Unlike many popular concepts, it cannot be quickly outgrown or come into conflict with new discoveries. Rather, it encourages reflection and rescues my thinking from the conflicts of dogmas and the clash of creeds. Years of intimate contact with persons and their problems have convinced me that we all share in common doubts, fears, and uncertainties, and that these negative pressures frequently lead to a general attitude of futility. Troubled human beings are often impelled to ask, why are we here? Why should we suffer? And why should we have faith in anything? It seems to me that the law of rebirth, with its simple, positive statement of man's essential purpose, is the only doctrine that answers all such questions reasonably and adequately. According to the teaching of rebirth, we are all here to grow and to learn. Self-improvement is possible to everyone, and if we build our philosophy of life around the willingness to grow cheerfully and wisely, we resolve most of our doubts concerning providence. We are not here merely to succeed on the physical plane. We are here to succeed totally, which means that we must improve as persons, seeking richer internal values, deeper understanding, and a better orientation to the universal plan. By this concept, daily experience becomes a constant invitation to learning, as this relates to self-knowledge and to the knowledge of all other things. The whole world is, then, like the traditional little red schoolhouse, and we are all students, willing or unwilling, learning our ABCs in the university of life. In the material world, education is recognized as a progressive procedure. The student graduates only after he has successfully advanced his various studies, passed his examinations, and proved his proficiency. By this process, it requires nearly 20 years to prepare the average child for a trade or profession, and much of his nature has remained uncultivated. It is also obvious that his internal life has been almost totally neglected. Accepting these evident facts, is it conceivable that man can attain complete spiritual maturity as a citizen of the universe in any single lifetime? regardless of ability or sincerity. Man is eternal. Learning is eternal. And the doctrine of rebirth provides the individual with conditions favorable for the final attainment of true wisdom and understanding. According to this doctrine, immediate success may not be likely, but ultimate failure is impossible. We live in a universe of infinite opportunity, we advance in the school of life according to ability and inclination, moved forward by the gentle but insistent proddings of the greatest of all teachers, the law of necessity. When we realize that we all come into this world to increase understanding through experience, problems of human relationships are simplified. Associations become important because they bring ever-increasing opportunities for understanding, tolerance, and mutual improvement. We grow and mature together through the gracious privilege of sharing. Thus we come to realize that we can be friendly beings, mutually helpful, gaining a rich and lasting enjoyment from pleasant associations, and not attempting to dominate or possess each other. The school child must adjust his mind to the concept of learning, and when he does this, his lessons become valuable experiences. If he does not adjust, he is simply miserable. It is the same in the school of life. 
There is nothing in nature that denies man's right to be happy while he learns. There is a real and deep satisfaction when we keep faith with the spirit of growth. It is when we break faith and deny the ever-present good that we open ourselves to misery. If we really desire contentment and peace of mind, we must keep the laws governing our destinies. A successful, well-adjusted life must be built upon a solid internal faith and conviction. This means that we must know with inner certainty where we came from, why we are here, and whither we are going. In working with human problems, I have always noticed that the troubled person is the one whose basic beliefs are deficient. Let us see how the doctrine of rebirth supplies a working formula for right conduct. If we have lived in this world before, we bring with us into physical birth the total of our previous abilities and debilities. We are not new creatures, but living souls in the midstream of existence. There is a simple answer, therefore, to the question, where did we come from? We came from our own yesterdays, stretching back over hundreds of thousands of years. The newborn infant will inevitably develop a disposition bearing witness to the things he has done before, to the persons he has been. The practical result, in conduct, of this knowledge is that it is no longer necessary to blame our associates or environment for our troubles, or to feel that some are born to be happy and others to be miserable. We have earned certain good things for ourselves by former action. We have also made mistakes and permitted false concepts to influence our character. In other words, we are in the process of working out causes which we ourselves set in motion, either in the present life or in former lives. Although we do not normally remember our previous existences, if the law of nature be just, we must be in the place most suitable to our real needs. We come into life to improve ourselves, building new careers upon foundations fashioned long ago and far away. Someone will always ask, if I have lived before, why have I no memory of former lives? Would not such a memory be of the greatest value? Let us think this through together. How many of us can face constructively our memories of the present life? Often the major problem in a neurosis is that the individual is plagued by the things he remembers. But fortunately, nature has a way of submerging memory patterns, thus giving us a greater opportunity to make present decisions without prejudice, self-pity, or morbid recollections. Of course, we have a new brain at each birth, and this unfolds to produce the new personality. Even so, as the brain develops, it is apparent that the soul does bestow impulses, attitudes, and pressures that cannot be fully explained unless they originated in a previous life. Thus, although we may not remember incidents, we certainly bring forward with us the totals of previous accomplishments. Would we actually gain anything if we could look back over the long and painful struggle of growth? Would we live better today if we could recollect all the pain of former births and deaths, the wrongs we had done, the debts we had left unpaid, and the opinions which have burdened our spirit for ages? Is nature not wiser and kinder when it places in our new-fashioned hands the skills we have acquired in the past? and invites us to use them in newer and better ways, free from all guilts, remorses, and repentances. This aspect of the doctrine of rebirth also explains the otherwise baffling question of genius. Is it accident, heredity, or the will of God? Each of us has capacities and potentials, and it may be wise to recall that the sons of the great are not always great. And from the most humble circumstances, magnificent human beings have arisen. Are we content to assume that we are merely biological incidents? Where would the justice be if we are only the products of some ancestral bloodstream? I am convinced that if ethics exists, if there is any right or justice in the world, the doctrine of rebirth reveals this more clearly than any other teaching that we know. Some have argued against rebirth 
on the ground that nature never repeats itself, and it is therefore unreasonable to assume that man should return many times to become involved in similar sequences of occurrences. I do not believe that this argument is sound, for the simple reason that life is a rich and diversified sphere of activity. The doctrine does not teach that we have to learn the same lesson twice, rather that there is more than one lesson. Once we have outgrown a mistake, it is no longer a problem. But there is far more to outgrowing than can possibly be accomplished in a single embodiment. The prospect of reliving a difficult career is not attractive. But rebirth teaches that education is progressive, not repetitive. Problems can exist only in those areas where our abilities are undeveloped or insufficient. Some of us, for example, are no longer troubled with possessiveness, but we are still burdened with fear, or worry, or a bad temper. Recognizing our faults, we correct them, and we are then free from them, and have the gracious opportunity of turning our attention to those phases of our characters which are still troublesome. If we bear in mind that it is the soul or psychic self, and not the body that is unfolding, and that the permanent records of growth are preserved in the soul, and not the brain, we will appreciate why we are so strongly impelled by our own psychic instincts and intuitions, which make available to us the real picture of our complete selves. If we accept the idea that the conscious soul of man passes from one form to another because of the divine impulse within it to know all things and to achieve all things, it becomes evident why we are here. It is here and now that we must face ourselves and pay the just debts resulting from previous action. To the honest man, this is not a punishment. Our human society decrees that we must meet our obligations. If we borrow money, we must pay it back. If we are improvident, impoverishment is likely to result. If we are unpleasant, we will be lonely and neglected. If we are unkind, we will lose the esteem and respect of our friends. On the more optimistic side, no good deed is without its ultimate reward. What we have earned comes to us, and we have the privilege of planning a constructive destiny, sincerely convinced that we can so live that we deserve greater opportunity and happier circumstances in the future. The doctrine of rebirth, therefore, teaches that life is based upon a merit system, with equality of opportunity, privileges, and responsibility. When we come to know internally that this is true, it gives us a stronger and more lasting faith. There are no longer any accidents. Good and evil are terms to cover our just deserts. Good rewards good, and evil penalizes evil. If we keep the laws governing life, these laws will protect us. And we know as an eternal fact that as we sow, so shall we reap. Most of all, we are encouraged to plan a proper destiny, fully knowing that it is in our own power to earn security and peace of mind, and that when we have earned a better condition, nothing can prevent us from enjoying the results. It is evident that this teaching, with its all-embracing pattern, should also solve the riddle of whither we are going. We are moving forward into the future that we are building for ourselves. Tomorrow is based upon the works of today. As we have lived before and live now, so we shall live again. And the transition of death in no way interferes with the journey of the soul. Why should we fear life? Why should we want to escape into some fabled paradise? We may be uncomfortable in our present life, but if we recognize and correct the causes within ourselves, we can face the future with cheerfulness of spirit. If we live well, there is nothing to fear, here or hereafter. If we understand ourselves and our place in the universal plan, we will want to grow. Perhaps the body we inhabit is fatigued with age, but the life in man cannot and will not accept infirmity or death. The wise look forward to new and greater opportunity for progress and service. It is only the tired and disillusioned who are afraid to contemplate rebirth. Weariness is not due to the universal plan through which we are evolving. It is due only to our own ignorance and the negative attitudes we have not conquered. 
Once the light shines in our own hearts, we love life and realize the blessed privilege of sharing the good things that life bestows. Thus, indeed, death is dissolved in immortality. For many people, old age and the fear of death seem to close forever the door of opportunity. The materialistic attitude toward death has resulted in the widespread belief that life belongs to the young and that it is useless to begin new projects in older years. The doctrine of rebirth changes all this by bestowing the conviction that it is never too late to build for the future or to advance some program for self-improvement. We really have no proof that the death of the body is the end of the individual. But as long as we identify ourselves with our bodies, we will fear any circumstance which will injure or destroy that body. Such fear, whether we realize it or not, destroys the dignity of life, even while we live. Yet actually, man cannot experience death, for he is himself part of life, and he instinctively believes that life cannot die. When we accept rebirth, therefore, we sustain one of the deepest of our internal convictions. Inspired by the realization that we move forward along a path of infinite opportunity, we experience a deep and abiding confidence in the divine plan. When we are freed from negative forebodings by our acceptance of immortality, death is no longer the master of destiny, but the wise and faithful servant of life. The doctrine of rebirth brings a wonderful serenity of spirit into our lives. We realize that we live in a good world with essentially fine people, and we all share together wonderful opportunities for self-improvement. We no longer find it possible to blame others for our own faults or mistakes. Self-improvement remains a constant challenge, but we learn to labor patiently, knowing that competitive procedures which might bring sorrow or misfortune to others are unnecessary. Progress is natural, simple, and inevitable, and whatever time is needed for the perfection of any work is available. Excessive ambition, dissatisfaction, envy, jealousy, all these negative elements lose their power to tyrannize and oppress the soul, for we know that we have the right to earn whatever we need for our own happiness and security. What we deserve will come to us. Our labor is to become more deserving. Because I believe in rebirth, I can look forward to the changes of the years without anxiety, bear adversity with patience, certain in myself that all creatures, from the least to the greatest, are growing and unfolding according to the cosmic plan. I can worship God without reservation, convinced that no arbitrary power, superior or inferior, can interfere with the vast program of progress to which we all belong. The past bestows experience, the present numerous valuable lessons, the future infinite opportunity. I therefore choose to believe in the doctrine of rebirth because it sustains my veneration for life and reveals to me the loving wisdom of God, the integrity of natural law, and the dignity of the human soul.